Welcome everybody in this week's seminar. We have a pleasure to host uh, Daniel uh, Broad from, from Niteroi. Uh, so Daniel is an expert on uh, complexity uh, theory and quantum mechanics. Uh, specifically, he worked on uh, various quantum supremacy proposals uh, during the, the years. So boson sampling, uh, Gaussian boson sampling as well. Okay, he also specializes in like uh, studies of indistinguishable, uh, indistinguishable uh, particles in uh, like, yeah, in the context of photonics and, and quantum information. That, Dan is now a permanent, I think, like a permanent professor, I think, or associate professor in yeah. Universita Federal Funes in Niteroi. In the past, he was a postdoctoral fellow in Perimeter Institute, but he originates from, I mean, Scientifically, I guess, from Nitero when he yeah. did his PhD with Ernesto Galva. Yes, yeah, so uh, it's great to have you. Dan, sorry for the somewhat chaotic introduction from the end <laughs> to the beginning, but yeah, uh, so we are happy to, uh, to have Dan, who will be talking about some new developments in uh, Gaussian boson something. So the screen is yours. Dan, thanks for coming. Yeah, okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Michal, for the introduction. So, you know, as I said, I'm Daniel. I'm talking to you from Niteroi in Brazil. That's just across the bay from Rio. And I'm going to tell you today a little bit about this recent work that we did on this new proposal called Bipartite Gaussian Boson Sampling. Um, this is a joint work with Daniel Greer um, from IPC, Juan Miguel Hazola, and Nicolas Casado from um, Xanadu, and Marcos Alonso, which was a, a master's student here with me. So um, I'm going to start with a little bit of motivation, though I expect most people are familiar with it, but I'm just going to go through it anyway, so we can kind of start on the same page. And this work is going to be within this paradigm of quantum supremacy or quantum computational advantage. And of course, you know, the motivation there is that building a universal quantum computer is really, really hard. So, you know, you ask, what is the best demonstration of raw computational power that you can give in the sort of short term? And there are several proposals for this. So boson sampling is sort of the one that laid the blueprint for this entire field, I would say, almost a decade ago. And boson sampling has already developed into a few variants, um, scattershot boson sampling, Gaussian boson sampling, the one that I'm going to tell you about today. But there are other alternative proposals like random circuit sampling, the stuff that Google's been doing, and the guys at um, uh, Shanghai have also done some experiments. And there's a bunch of alternatives, right? So, you know, circuits of commuting gates, the um, Michal has worked on this magic state fermion sampling paper, which is really nice, and a host of other uh, proposals. Of course, and, that's very nice. <laughs> <laughs> and, okay, so, you know, what are the, the, you know, the cons, the bad things about doing it, about the sort of general paradigm? First, these devices are highly susceptible to noise. Um, there are no concrete practical applications that we know of. There are several proposals, but no kind of killer wrap that, you know, this is what you would use this device for. And one of the main ones recently is that it's very hard to check if the device is working, right? Just by virtue of the fact that it's hard to simulate, it also seems to imply that it's hard to check if it's working. And this is a very intense debate that has been going around um, over the next, over the few um, years, last years. Um, and the, but the benefits are first, you know, by definition, you would expect these devices to require simpler resources, simply because you know you're talking about a quantum quantum device that's not universal, so you know it's expected to be simpler to implement than a universal computer. Um, the reason I care about this the most is that I think this can give us new insights on quantum computing and quantum optics. So maybe by understanding why these devices have this sort of computational complexity, we can understand more why quantum computing works in general. And one other thing is that it definitely pushes technological development, right? So if you look at the development of this field over the last decade, and I'm going to give you some numbers shortly, um, I think it's very safe to say that there's a major contribution in pushing forward the technological development that would need needed to build the larger experiments that came precisely from this motivation, right? So from this sort of um, paradigm. And so this is the summary of my talk. I'm going to tell you, we'll start talking a little bit about boson sampling, and I'm going to give you an outline of the hardness proof, right? So an outline of the complexity theory behind boson sampling. And the reason is that our new proposal is kind of technical to explain. So it's going to be easier for me to, to kind of do the simpler version first of boson sampling, and then kind of point out where our proposal is different, 
right? So what did we have to adapt from the original boson sampling proposal to get what we have? Um, then I'm going to tell you a little bit about Gaussian boson sampling, which was a development um, from a few years ago on boson sampling. Um, and then I'm gonna tell you what our new proposal consists of, okay? And how it kind of fits within this whole story. So let me start telling you a little bit about boson sampling. I assume most people are familiar with the sort of basics, um, but let me describe the model. Um, the idea is that, you know, we start with M modes that have, can have um, photons or not have photons or bosons in general, doesn't need to be photons. And we populate N of them with a single photon each, okay? And then these things are gonna pass through an interferometer, which is a linear optical transformation. And you know, what defines it as a linear optical transformation is that it acts linearly at the level of creation operators. And we're going to detect how many photons ended up in each mode at the end, right? And this is going to be an outcome that we're going to constantly label S. And then you can do this several, several times and you can sort of build up statistics and try to reproduce the probability distribution that sort of governs the experiment, okay? And so we're going to label the outcomes in this way. You know, so S is going to be a string of integers where each SI tells us how many photons were output in mode I. And the distribution over these strings is what we're going to call D. And this is going to be the main object that we're going to care about through the entire talk, right? So every time I talk about D distribution, this is what I mean. So what is the task? Okay, so the boson sampling task as a computational task is to produce a sample from that distribution. Right, so you want a device that you press a button, it spits out a string of integers that was sampled from that probability distribution. And for a quantum device, that's easy. And you know, I'm a theorist, that's why I can say this sort of stuff and put scare quotes here. It's not actually you know easy, but it's definitely it's easy in the sense that it's just kind of you know the quantum device behaving on its own, just behaving naturally, if you want. But there is evidence that it is very hard for a classical computer to do. And the core of this evidence comes from the fact that transition probabilities in the systems are given by permanence of some matrices. And the permanence is a notoriously hard function to compute. Okay. And you know, even approximate simulation, you can give evidence that it's hard. And by approximate here, we just means that you know, the task now is to sample from some probability distribution that's close in one norm or total variation distance um, to the ideal one predicted by quantum mechanics. And the intention of allowing approximate simulation is because you know, no physical device that you built in the lab is going to be perfect. So why, will you, why are you asking the classical computer, you know, why would you set the computational task to be to perfectly sample from the distribution if experimentally you're not gonna do that, right? So if you want to compare the powers of a classical device and a quantum device, you should ask them to you know, perform the same task. And if you look you know, at how long, how long it takes to compute the permanent for a transition of an n-photon system, you get that the milestone that you would expect um, these boson sampling devices to sort of push against the boundary of what a classical computer could do is maybe um, a few hundred photons. Okay. Um, sorry, Dan. Can I ask a question about uh, yep. this of notion of approximate simu uh, simulation? Because yeah, it's. I mean, okay, it's a well-established definition, but actually. It's, it's, it's quite demanding, right? Like to to, uh, yes. to, to ensure that you sample from uh, yeah. probabilities which are approximates in L1 distance. Yeah, um, that's true. And like, so it might be like, even if you had like this, it, it's okay for boson something, I think it, it was even proven that uh, in the black box setting, sort of because almost because of that, you, you cannot, efficiently certify that you that your device is working properly right yeah, uh, yeah. so uh, like, uh, okay maybe you know, okay so no this is maybe a question for for the end of the uh, for the for the end of the talk some general question because like okay it would be maybe nice to just relax this uh, this this assumption. It, it would it would right. So so you know in in, in both of them, like ten years ago, this was already much better than the previous thing, which was just kind of approximating to multiplicative error each of, of the course. single probabilities, which was a kind of absolutely horrible. And of course, you know, any time that you model some experimental imperfection, it already takes you way far in total variation distance from the ideal thing. So you know, this is not this is still far from realistic. It, it's you know one attempt, one thing that you can try. But I agree, you know, you could relax this and it would be good to relax this. 
So, you know, the first experiments were done in 2012 with three or four photons each and all of them following this kind of same blueprint that I've described for the experiment. And as far as I can tell, although this might be a bit out of date, the largest um, boson sampling experiments was done by the guys in China in Shanghai with 20 photons and 60 moles. Okay. Now, this is the largest experiment that I can recall within this original boson sampling proposal. Right, so there have been larger experiments in Gaussian boson sampling, and I'm going to mention that um, shortly. But you know, these guys use quantum dot sources to prepare those single photon states, and that's very demanding. So you know, this is the sort of record, hold, record holder that I know of for kind of standard boson sampling. But you know, in in seven years, you jumped from being able to manipulate two or three photons at a time to building an, an experiment with twenty photons, right? So. I think that that's, that's definitely faster development than I would have thought when I started working on this. So let me give you now the sort of proof outline for boson sampling, right? The hardness, the kind of main steps in this hardness proof. And I broke it down in three steps. And this is not usually broken down like this in the literature, but I think this identification of these three stages makes it easier to identify where our system is going to be different from the original boson sampling. Okay, so I'm going to go through each of these steps in a little bit of detail. So the first one that I've been calling from distributions to probabilities. Okay, so the step one, you start with the assumption and this is going to be our ground assumption, right? So this is the thing that we're going to start assuming and then we're going to make a bunch of arguments and add some extra conjectures and we're going to arrive at something that looks like a contradiction. So, you know, this is going to be evidence that this thing here is not, not um, Right, because although you know, subjects to a few conjectures. So you know, this kind of ground assumption is that there exists a classical algorithm that samples efficiently from some distribution that's close to the ideal one, to this epsilon error. Right, that's the uh, kind of ground assumption. And so you can imagine that you know you have some classical device and you feed it as input um, a description of the experiment, and you know somehow maybe the device knows or um, leverages the facts that it knows or something, the, the probability distribution that governs this, but that's not what it gives you, right? So the classical device is going to give you just a list of samples. And the reason to sort of think about the sampling problems rather than computing the probabilities, for example, is that, you know, that's what the quantum device does, right? The, the quantum device is also, it also knows somehow the probability distribution and its inner workings, but it doesn't give you that, right? It only gives you samples. And you can you know, repeat the experiment a bunch of times to construct some approximation of the probability distribution, but you know, the device doesn't give you the values for the probabilities. So you know, we're, not, we're not gonna ask the classical device to do that either. So you start you know, with the hypothesis that such a machine exists in principle. And now suppose that you can prove the following fact, okay? which is you, you can prove in many of these, that you know, given some outcome S that you care about, there exists some class of states some class of outcomes that all look the same as that one that you care about, okay? And they look the same here. What do I mean by that? Um, for instance, as an example, if the interferometer matrix in the sort of boson sampling experiment is high random, so it's chosen uniformly from, from um, unitary matrices, um, you get that the outcomes are permutation invariants, right? So, you know, from the point of view of these ensemble of hard matrices, all outcomes that can be obtained by relabeling the output modes are essentially equivalent to each other. Okay. So this is when I say when I say that they look the same, right? So you assume that there exists some sort of symmetry in this ensemble of matrices that you're implementing that maps these states once again. And then you know the next technical step, which I'm gonna gloss over, you use a thing called Stockmeyer's algorithm, which is not super important, but the conclusion that you get is the following, okay? Just from the assumption that a classical simulator exists for this device, that someone can classically simulate this probability distribution, you get the conclusion that there exists a moderately super powerful classical machine. And, you know, I'm kind of joking here with this terminology, but what I mean technically is it's a BPP with an NP Oracle machine. But this is a little bit of a distraction because we're not going to use the fact that this is a BPP with the NP Oracle, blah, blah, blah. So it doesn't, work, it doesn't matter too much what this guy is, okay, for the argument. So for now, I'm just gonna say, you know, the conclusion is that there exists a moderately super powerful classical machine that can actually estimate the individual probabilities 
to some error epsilon over the size of that space that you that the states look identical, right? And you know, so kind of pictorically, what that means is this: from the assumption that that machine that we had described before exists, you conclude that there exists a super powerful machine with magic powers that can actually compute one of the output probabilities for you. Okay. Now, this error here, the intuition is that you know this one norm error was epsilon, which you can think of as you know the original probability distribution. You had some epsilon error budget to assign to all of the different events, right? But now, if you're talking about a bunch of the events that all look the same, you're kind of forced to attribute this error budget more or less evenly between the events. So this suggests that you know you probably each of the events is going to have a, an error in the probability that um, goes like this, right? Because you imagine that this error is evenly spread out in the subspace. So one important part of these works is to identify a subspace that's large enough such that this error is small, right? And large enough is going to be precise shortly. Um, sorry, that just some technical comments. So this approximation, if I recall correctly, happens with it's not unconditional, but it happens with some probability over the choice yeah, yeah. of, uh, let's say, unitaries from your understanding. That's true. That's true. That's true. So everything here has some, you know, it, it can make two types of mistakes, right? So it has some probability to fail completely. And if it succeeds, it's still only an approximation to within this amount. So you can kind of, you can sort of shift the error budget between these two things, right? So you can either kind of spread this error evenly and then every outcome is going to be wrong by this tiny amount. Or you can say, oh, I'm going to accumulate all of my error in one of the events, but then it's very unlikely that it's the one event that I care about, right? So that in, that's goes into that um, prob probability of failure that Michal mentioned, which I'm kind of um, glossing over here. So, you know, this is step one, right? Now, one important thing here is, is that this has nothing to do with boson sampling so far. Right? I didn't call invoke any linear optics or anything. This is very, very generic. And this is a step that's sort of common to all, to most of these proposals. And this step we're not gonna touch, all right? So this is going to be the same in our case as well. Now, the second step is one where you have to identify an actual hard function within your space of probabilities, right? So you want your outcome probabilities to encode some hard function that you're going to kind of leverage some complexity theory afterwards. And for boson sampling, this, you get this kind of for free because the transition probabilities in boson sampling are given by some permanence of some matrices and the permanent is known to be a hard function to compute. So, you know, boson sampling, the probabilities in boson sampling are naturally expected to be hard things to compute, okay? And, um, and in fact, you know, historically, let's say, um, Scott Aronson and Alex Arkhipov they actually worked the other way around, right? So they, you know, they wanted to make a conjecture about permanence and then they sort of backtracked and, oh, look, linear optics evolves according to permanence. So let's now say something about linear optics. Um, so very quickly, let me tell you how this um, matrix is constructed because it's going to be relevant shortly. Um, you know, this is a sub matrix from the original interferometer matrix. So use the original interferometer matrix. And you assume that you want to compute the probability of transition from some state T to some state S, okay? Now imagine that your state T, as an example, has um, a single photo in the first mode, a single photo in the second mode, and your output state S has a single photo in the second and a single photo in the third. So the way that you construct this matrix UST is you choose the columns according to your input state, right? So whenever the input state has a photo and you choose that column, Whenever the output state has a photon, you choose that row. And combining these things, you construct this matrix. All right. So the probabilities are permanent of sub matrices of the unitary matrix. And one important thing here is that if you have collisions, so if you have two photons ending up in the same mode, you're going to choose a row twice. Right. And this is the thing that generally you want to avoid because the permanent is a hard function. But if you start having too many repeated rows, it becomes easy. So you want to avoid these collisions in principle, okay? So the conclusion, you know, if we take what we had in step one and just kind of append this extra step two, the conclusion now is that, you know, these moderately super powerful classical machines can compute the permanence of these matrices to some, some error that's just 
given by this, right? So again, it's that epsilon over the size of the space plus this extra bit that's multiplying the permanent here, right? Okay, so let's keep that on the side of our memories for now. And let's look at step three, right? So step three is where most of the complexity theory is actually going to come up. And that's where the conjectures are gonna appear. So I say that this is where the magic happens, okay? So before I tell you what these kind of hardness conjectures are, we're gonna make two choices that are gonna be important. The first one is that this interferometer matrix is hard random, right? I already mentioned this before. And the second is that the number of modes is actually more than quadratic in the number of photons, right? So this is kind of a dilute limit where you have many, many more modes than photons. When you combine these two things, you know, they imply first that these no collision states where you, know, you only get a single photon at each output at most, these no collision states dominate. So you're looking at that subspace where the permanents are the hardest ones to compute. And the other thing is, which is important, is that you know, if the number of modes is sufficiently larger than the number of photons, the submatrices that you care about, they look independent as Gaussian matrices. Right? Now, technically, um, you only have you know, proof of this if the number of modes is actually greater than n to the five. Um, no one, I think, takes this scaling too seriously, but you know, it, we, we're gonna fix this scaling when, we, when I tell you about our proposal, so that's nice. Um, but yeah, so you know, people just generally quote this guy that you need to be quadratic. Um, sorry, now, just a qu yeah. question. So, so your proposal uh, like has better scaling in the end? Yeah, I mean, it's still gonna be quadratic, Okay, so um, better than the, this guaranteed yeah. one. Yeah. yeah, better than this one that, as I said, no one takes too seriously, but sure. You know, this is, you can think of this as a kind of loophole that we've closed. Yes. Um, but the, the important thing I think that's gonna be nicer about us, our proposal is this. So um, here, you know, you have two independent reasons to require that the number of modes is large. You know, these are two independent things. Um, this, the first one we're still gonna need um, but the second one, we're not, right? So I'm going to tell you exactly why, but this condition is actually going to be completely dropped in our proposal. So, you know, this is why, one of the reasons why we were excited about this, because, you know, I think it's kind of drops one of these obstacles towards improving this, you know, nasty experimental regime. Okay, so under these two assumptions, under these two choices, we now can make two conjectures. Um, the first one is this anti-concentration conjecture that says that permanence of Gaussian matrices do not concentrate too much around zero. I'm not going to go into the details of why this is important. I'm just going to skip over, um, but it's kind of a technical conjecture that's necessary. And the second one, I think, is the sort of meatier one, the, the nice, the more important one, which is that the permanence of Gaussian matrices are typically super extra hard to compute. Okay. Again, I'm saying super extra hard as a kind of a joke, but technically I mean sharp P hard. Right. And again, it's not very important what the technical de definition of sharp P is because it's not going to be important at the end. Um, but just assume that you know, these permanents are within this very, very hard class of, of functions. So now the, the blueprint, the outline of the proof is this, right? So when you combine the first two steps, our conclusion was that you had these moderately super powerful classical machines that could approximate Gaussian permanents. But when you now combine these two conjectures, you have that these Gaussian permanents are like super extra hard to compute, right? And moderately super powerful and super, super extra hard are things which are expected to be very, very different in a way that I'm gonna describe for you. Um, so you have these two things and the glue that sticks them together is the fact that the collision free subspace is large enough for them to match. So remember that I told you that the size of the subspace where you're hiding the events is important because it sort of tunes the error in the approximation. Well, you know, if you choose the state, the subspace where there are no collisions, that is large enough. And when you combine these two things, you know, you say that these um, BPP with an NP Oracle machines can solve these sharp P hard problems. Okay. And this is considered unlikely in complexity theory. And so you, this conclusion you can use as evidence that your original assumption is false. And the original assumption was that there exists a classical simulator of bosons, right? So this is the sort of core, um, sort of original blueprint for a hardness proof. It does have a bunch of conjectures, but you know, you arrive at something which is kind of a contradiction at the end, or which is at least very unexpected, and you treat that as evidence that then the original assumption is false. 
And the reason why you know, this is expected to be not true, so you think that this sort of is unlikely, this conclusion is unlikely, has to do with the sort of landscape of complexity um, classes. And here I displayed this kind of central ones. The blue ones are ones that people will have seen probably in like Nielsen and Schwang, you know, kind of P and BPP, which are the kind of classical computation, um, BQP, which are quantum computers, um, and P, which is pretty, pretty famous. But the ones that we care about are the two in red, okay? Now this diagram, it, it shows inclusion of these complexity classes, right? So, you know, P is contained is a subset of NP, um, NP is a subset of this guy here, which is the polynomial hierarchy and so on, okay? So what this conclusion here tells you is that, you know, assuming all of the assumptions are true, you would have that these two red classes are actually the same because what we showed is that machines that live here can compute problems that live here, which are actually expected to be much, much, much harder than they, what they can do. And technically what this shows is that this guy, which is in the middle of the two is sandwiched between the two would collapse, right? So these two things, these three things would be the same. And that is the, the collapse of the polynomial hierarchy, which is expected to be very unlikely. Okay. All right. So that's the sort of reason why we have, we believe that boson sampling is hard to simulate. Um, let me just summarize this entire argument and sort of compare with what we do in our work. Um, so this step one is very, very generic, right? It's the same for all of these complex, like these quantum supremacy proposals, quantum computational advantage. Oh, sorry. Um, right. And this one in our result, we don't touch. We just lift it directly from the original boson sample. The second step was one where, you know, we start with the probabilities and we need to find some hard function living inside those probabilities, right? And this is very specific to each proposal. This is new work that you have to do for boson sampling, for Gaussian boson sampling, for our case, for random circuit sampling. So you need to do this again every time. And this is where our main new idea is going to live, right? So the main thing that we proved is going to be on identifying a particular hard function um, when the probabilities of this Gaussian boson sampling systems. And the third part, which uses these complexity theoretic arguments is where most of the hard work actually went, right? So the meat of our technical work, which was kind of just gluing everything together um, was in this step three. So I'm going to tell you um, what our proposal is, but be first, first I need to do a small detour on what Gaussian boson sampling is to sort of motivate why we um, care about and what led us to this research project. Um, and, Gaussian boson sampling is a variant of boson sampling, um, which is a word that I'm maybe not super comfortable using in these times, but you know, it's a kind of change in boson sampling. Um, and the idea of Gaussian boson sampling is this, right? So rather than starting with a Fox state input with a well-defined number of photons, you actually start with a bunch of squeezed states, okay? So you input a bunch of squeezed states, but all the rest is the same. So you have this interferometer, which is kind of this linear optical transformation. And at the end, you're going to detect how many photons ended up in each mode. So the detectors at the end are the same. You've only moved, changed the input state, okay? And um, one annoying thing is that now the photon number is not, not fixed. So before in boson sampling, you know, you prepare n photons and at the end, you're gonna detect n photons unless some of them get lost along the way. Um, here, you know, the input state already doesn't have a well-defined photon number. So now you have to deal with the fact that every time that you run the experiment, you observe a different number of photons. And the main difference um, to kind of standard boson sampling is that the probabilities, rather than given by permanence, they're actually now given by these other matrix functions, which are the Hafnians. Um, I'm, I'm not gonna talk about the Hafnians in our work, so I'm not gonna define it here. It's not very important. Um, but the thing is that your probability now is given by this normalization factor, right? So this Z, you can think of it as the sort of normalization factor over the different photon numbers, right? Over the distribution over the different photon numbers. And now, you know, it's given by this half of this, this sub matrix of interferometer. Um, and, you know, why, why was Gaussian boson sampling important? Why did people care about this? Um, the main difference are first, it's much, much easier to implement in the lab. Right, kind of building these squeeze states, it's much easier than building kind of pure high purity Fox states. And um, as a way to sort of illustrate that, 
the largest Gaussian boson sampling experiment that I know of um, was published last year, um, also by the guys in Shanghai, by a um, group by Chow Yang Lu. And um, that experiment um, was done with up to 113 detected photons in 144 modes, right? So, you know, compare that to the 20 photons that you have for standard boson sample as a sort of record holder. Now, you know, compare these two numbers, but don't compare them too much because they're not really comparable because there's slightly different systems with different complexity um, arguments. And, you know, it's, it's really hard to, to kind of be very precise about which experiment, you know, how many photons in boson sampling are equivalent to how many photons in Gaussian boson sampling. But, you know, it's, it's definitely clear that this is a much larger experiment. Like 130 photons is pretty impressive. I would never have thought that this was possible like three years ago. Okay. And um, I know for a fact, just by talking with people that are working on these experiments, that there are larger experiments on the way, right? So we should see in the next few months or years, um, or maybe this year, um, some considerably larger experiments coming up. Okay. So this is the main, main motivation of considering this Gaussian boson sampling kind of um, model, right? Because it, it really does let you scale up the experiments. But there are a few problems. Um, one of them, as I mentioned, is this kind of variable photo number, which makes it hard to actually gauge the complexity because you know, the complexity is usually tied with the number of photons. But if it varies every time that you do the experiment, it's a bit, a bit more annoying to analyze, though it's not impossible. But also the original complexity argument wasn't very tight. Right? And it also needed new conjectures. Um, and you know, maybe you don't care about this too much, but it's one of the reasons we, we kind of started working on this. So let's kind of focus on that a little bit. You know, what is missing in this original Gaussian boson sampling proposal? First, it was really, the original paper was very light on the complexity theory side, right? So they didn't work out all of that argument that I told you at the beginning for boson sampling. They didn't do the, the equivalent version for Gaussian boson sampling. They just kind of, studied Gaussian boson sampling as a sort of physical proposal and just you know, said, hey, it looks like most of the things should be equivalent on complexity theory side, but didn't actually work it out. And in principle, Gaussian boson sampling requires new conjectures, right? So in the same way that for boson sampling, you had that kind of permanent anti-concentration conjecture and the permanent of Gaussians conjecture that I mentioned earlier, here you would need a kind of half union of Gaussians conjecture or half union anti-concentration conjecture. So you did need to pose new conjectures. And you know, so what? What's the problem with that, right? If you're gonna conjecture stuff that you don't know if it's true or not, you know, what's to stop you from just conjecturing whatever, right? And the reasons, you know, I think that this is undesirable. Um, okay, so first, the half mean is a much, much less studied fun function than the permanent, right? So when you say, look, oh, the permanent is known to be a hard function and we conjecture that it's a hard function on average, I think that we have um, stronger evidence for that just from the fact that people care about permanence and have been thinking about this permanence for much longer and in much more depth than they have about the happiness, right? It's a much more well-studied function. So, you know, if, if it was easy to compute an average, maybe you'd expect someone would ha have already proven that for independent reasons. Um, and also, of course, you know, this, you know, people, the permanent of Gaussian's conjecture is something that's been around um, in the context of boson sampling for almost a decade now. And people have been trying to attack it from the several different fronts and so far, you know, no luck. So, so far it's withstanding. Um, but also in the case of permanence, weaker versions of the conjectures are known to hold. And I don't know if that's, the tr if that's true for half minutes, right? So I at least it hasn't been worked out. So you can say that, you know, at least baby versions of the conjectures are known in the boson sampling case. And in the Gaussian boson sampling, you don't even have that. And, you know, in the, as a general kind of philosophical principle, I think that the fewer conjectures, the better, right? So if you could just show that all of these systems are dependent on two or three equivalent conjectures, that would be good, right? So if random circuit sampling was hard for the same reasons as boson sampling, that would be pretty cool. So you know, if, if you can unify these conjectures, it's better. So the sort of these observations are what led us um, to our work. And now I'm gonna tell you about that. So I'm gonna describe you what our new proposal is, which is this bipartite Gaussian boson sampling. I'm going to tell you a little bit about how the hardness proof goes. And in particular, you know, what are the differences from the original boson sampling result? And you know, if I have time and people are still around, I'm gonna mention a little bit about an additional result on how to deal with collision outcomes that we got, okay?
So remember that this was the Gaussian boson sampling model, right? All right, can I just have, sorry, yeah. like one, one comment. So one can sort of, I fully agree with everything uh, that you said then about the motivation, uh, yeah. like to unify, uh, like to, to have as like small number of conjectures possible and uh, to ideally connect to like one well-studied object. Right, but yeah. sort of at the same, uh, like that can be also used as a motivation for other proposals to work on the technical level on those functions, right? Right, uh, right, right, right. And this right, is right. what happened, for example, for random circuit sampling. So they're like yeah, actually sure. just I think one year before actually Google had its experiment. Like people, I mean, okay, it's not fully comparable, but they worked hard to kind of to match hardness conject, let's say, status of conjectures for boson sampling. In the that, that's fair now. enough, that's fair enough. And that's definitely true for, for Hafnians as well, right? So I know that, you know, the people that have been working, especially the guys at Xenadu, for example, that have been working a lot of capture boson sampling, you know, they're really pushing to kind of prove interesting results regarding the Hafnian and they're really trying to understand those functions more deeply. So I, I agree that that's true as well. Um, okay, so this was the sort of, um, this was the Gaussian boson sampling proposal. Let me tell you what the new thing is, all right? So this bipartite Gaussian boson sampling, you know, it starts similar to, to GBS. Um, here we have a bunch of squeezed states and I've drawn them in different colors because what we want here is to have pairs of states squeezed by the same amount, okay? So, you know, green, blue, it, it, I don't mean the frequency or distinguishability or anything. I just mean that the different amounts of squeezing in each of these modes. And then you pass, you know, these pairs of squeezed states through a B-splitter, and that generates a two-mode squeezed state, okay, which is very well known in quantum optics. And these two-mode squeezed states, um, you're going to take one leg of each of them, and you're going to pass through one interferometer, U, and the other leg, you're going to pass through the other interferometer, W, okay? Um, and then you're going to, everything else just carries out the same. And then you're going to detect how many photons end up in each mode at the output. Um, but now what you're going to consider uh, an output is going to be the pair S, which is correspond to how many modes, how many photons ended up in each mode in the top modes, and T, which is just going to be how many photons ended up in, the, in each mode in the bottom modes, right? And it's a property of these two mode squeeze states that they generate photons in pairs. So what happens then is that um, the num total number of photons in the top half is going to be the same as the total number of photons in the bottom half. Okay, so we know that for a fact. And everything else is the same. So just repeat the experiment many times. And you know, each time you do, the total number of photons are going to be different, but it's always going to be the same in the top and bottom maps. And one important thing is that now you're assuming that you're going to control these kind of squeezing parameters in the, in the, the beginning. Okay? So it's kind of important to be able to control them independently. Now, you know, kind of conceptually, this is a particular case of Gaussian boson sampling. And it generalizes what is known as scatter shot boson sampling, which it's a different proposal that came around um, a few years ago. Okay, so it's technically a generalization of that. And the, th the interesting thing about when you do it this way, right, is that rather than having the probabilities be given by Hafnians of some matrices, you actually get that they're given by permanence of some matrices again, right? So this is why I didn't bother telling you what, too much what a Hafnian is, because at the end of the day, we would just write everything in terms of permanence again, just like in Boson. Okay. So the probability of a particular output event here is going to be the permanence of some matrix. I'll tell you what it is in a minute. Um, and just multiplied by that um, normalization factor in front. And this matrix C is just given by this. So it's, you know, it's this interferometer U times a diagonal matrix, which has the squeezing parameters times W transpose, okay? And the interesting thing here is that, so, and of course, CST is just gonna be a sub matrix of C built almost in the same way that we did before, but rather than having inputs choose columns and, and outputs choose rows, now we have that, you know, the top, um, ha top half modes choose columns and the bottom half node choose rows, right? But otherwise it's exactly the same. And this C, which is given by this, you know, this is actually, you know, just kind of looks like a singular value decomposition, right? So what this says is that you can actually implement an arbitrary complex matrix as the transition matrix here, okay? And 
this is the sort of, I, I have a few more technical things to say, but this is the sort of take home message from this, right? That the main contribution that we did, the main new thing that we did was show how to program a GBS device in such a way that you get permanence of arbitrary matrices rather than permanence of unitary or subunitary matrices. Okay. This was the sort of central um, core component of our result. And why is this important? You know, why, why do you care about this? So first of all, you know, remember before you had like a big unitary matrix and you were looking at sub matrices of it and you wanted those guys to look Gaussian, right? So if the big guy is high random, the small sub matrices look Gaussian. Well, now you don't actually need to do that. You can just choose C to be a Gaussian matrix directly, right? So now your large matrix is gonna be Gaussian and now the smaller ones are automatically going to look Gaussian. And what this means is that this removes one of the two barriers that you needed to get below the kind of quadratic number of potents regime. Right, because now you can just implement the matrix that you care directly, rather than have to it need that it appears as a sub matrix of a unitary matrix. Okay, so now even if you were, for instance, in the regime where M is linear in the number of protons, you would still be talking about Gaussian matrices. And um, I, I think this is this is one of the things that motivated us. That when I looked at this, I saw, oh no, I got very excited because this showed that you know you can you can maybe remove the other barrier. Um, to improving this as well. Turned out that we didn't manage to do that, but um, you know, that's kind of, I think that the fact that this removes one of the two barriers is good. Um, but the other things is that it, it makes it much more flexible, right? So there are other things that you can imagine doing in boson sampling um, by the fact that you can implement an arbitrary matrix. One of them is that maybe you can look for better or simpler hardness proofs, right? So maybe, you know, why do we care about the Gaussian ensemble in the first place? Maybe if you choose Rather than choose Gaussian matrices, you choose like some other ensemble, like Bernoulli matrices or whatever. Maybe you can prove anti-concentration or prove hardness, average case hardness for these other ensemble of matrices much more easily than you could do um, for Gaussian matrices, right? So I think that this is one of the main potentials of this idea. Um, but also you can think about, you know, this sort of programmability of the device in terms of application. So maybe someone finds a way to encode some interesting quantum simulation or whatever into these arbitrary matrices that maybe would be much harder to do if you're restricted to unitary matrices, right? So, you know, I think that this is also uh, uh, another interesting point. Okay, so, so far, what I've told you is that we've taken this Gaussian boson sampling machine and we can actually make the probabilities look exactly like they did in the boson sampling case, but now without the constraint that the matrix has to be unitary, right? So that sounds like free lunch, right? Like sounds make a major improvement with no drawbacks. You know, what's the catch? There's a few. Um, and the, the thing that's the most annoying about this is that, you know, if you're going to implement a random matrix, okay, remember that, you know, the squeezing parameters control the singular values of that matrix. So if now the matrix is random, this means that the squeezing parameters are themselves random variables. And this is, you know, this pops up in a bunch of places and it's kind of very annoying. So, you know, what's the first problem that you can imagine happening here, right? So if the squeezing parameters are random variables, you know, is there a chance that one of them is going to require some type of extreme resource, right? So these squeezing parameters, they control, for instance, the energy that you need to generate those states. So if I said, oh, I'm going to implement a Gaussian matrix, but then with high probability, one of the squeezing parameters is going to need exponentially large energy to build or something like that, right? Then that would make the entire thing um, break down, right? And, the proposal wouldn't make sense because it wouldn't be efficient to build in the lab the system. And as it turns out, this does not happen. So, you know, the literature on random matrix theory has a lot of, of has studied these kind of singular values of Gaussian matrices a lot. And, you know, there are known bounds on the largest singular value of these guys. So you can say, anyway, you can, it, that's safe. You know, you're not gonna get some sneaky, super large um, energy required to implement this or anything. Um, the second problem that appears is that remember that the photo number itself is a random bar, right? So the photo number varies each time that you run the experiment. The problem is that the average photo number, the mean photo number, depends on the squeezing parameters. So now the mean photo number is itself a random variable according to the choice of this large matrix, all right? And this is also kind of super annoying because now, you know, all of our complexity theory statements, they are of the type of, you know, are you going to compute the permanent of an n by n matrix, 
right? But now if the size of the matrix, the size of the permanent that you compute can vary a lot, that can just make everything break down. So, you know, one of the things that we needed to prove was to make sure that the number of photons doesn't vary too wildly, okay? And, you know, the solution is also go and invoke a bunch of results and massage things and use a bunch of random matrix three to it. And I'm going to tell, to show you how we fix this. You know, don't need to worry about this. It's ugly. Um, but basically what this is showing is that, you know, the number of photons that you're going to observe is unlikely to be too far from its own average. That's what it is, okay? And this unlikely to be too far is both over the choice of the random matrix and over the choice of um, the photo, actual photo number, right? So over the distribution of photo numbers on, with, for each fixed matrix, okay? Um, now this is again, kind of technical, so don't, let's not worry too much about the specifics of the lemma. It's just kind of another thing that we have to deal with. And the third one, which was the most problematic, and that's where it turns out that some new obstacles appear that we weren't expecting was in this normalization factor, right? Because the problem is that, remember when I told you that, you know, the first step in the proof was we have um, these probabilities can be estimated to some error. And the second one was, well, let's now identify a hard function in the probability. The problem is that the relation between the permanent and the probability now depends on this guy, right? And this normalization factor. So you have to take into account this guy in order to know how good your approximation is. And if this guy could be too large, then that would mess everything up again. So, right, so we need to show that, you know, if you look at, forget what, forget this part for now, it's kind of doesn't matter too much. But if you look at the relation between the size of this normalization factor and the size of the subspace that you're hiding your output in, you want this thing to not be too hard, right? Here is the place where we had to choose to consider only no collision outcomes as well, right? So only the no collision outcome subspace was large enough for what we needed. And we also had to prove an upper bound on this quantity, which was the annoying part. And again, this is the result that we have. Don't look at it too closely. But basically what it says is that this, um, this quantity Z, you know, you can show that it's not likely to be much, much larger than some exponential in there which was you know, sufficient for our purpose. So again, you know, we invoked a bunch of random matrix three results to this, okay? So you know, this was just to give you an idea of what was the kind of stuff that we had to worry about when proving the results, right? And the sort of things that we need to do. Um, so just to sort of recap how the result goes, you're gonna see it reflects very well what I told you about Boson sampling at the beginning. Um, you know, first step, you start with the distributions and you say something about probabilities. That's not changed. We didn't touch that. Second step, you know, you start with probabilities and you need to identify some hard function there. And the hard function that we found were essentially permanence, which is the same as in Boson sampling, right? Which is, you know, instead of the Hafnians that appear in Gaussian Boson sampling. Um, but, you know, as, as an improvement of a Boson sampling, we can consider arbitrary transition matrices rather than unitary matrices. Um, and what this says is that you don't need that large scaling to get Gaussian matrices. Um, and then the third step was to invoke these conjectures, right, of these hard functions. But this step, in our case, was actually identical to Boson sampling because we're again talking about permanence of Gaussian matrices. So it's the same set, you know, it's the same set of functions over the same ensemble as in the original Boson sampling paper. So what we've managed to prove here is that. Um, Gaussian boson sampling is as hard as boson sampling for the same set of reasons, okay? Based on the same set of conjectures. Um, and, I but ask, unfortunately, yeah, sure. Can I ask something that about this last point? So, uh, yeah, so it might be a kind of very, like for special, like a specialized question. So let's say when you, uh, okay, when you say that you reduce that, let's say, conjectures uh, that you have to assume in your proposal uh, sorry like when you when you compare them to conjectures from from standard boson something yep. um, uh, let's say like do you have in mind like uh, like okay also this anti-concentration conjecture yeah yep. and uh, conjecture regarding computation of uh, permanence of Gaussians to uh, to some additive accuracy. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's exactly yes. the same. They're gotcha. exactly the same two conjectures. Yes. So can I ask? Okay, maybe. Okay, I okay. This is okay. I stop now. Thanks. <laughs> no, you can ask. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, okay, so I'm almost done. Um, uh, I just want to give a very quick outline of some other thing that we proved. Oh, oh, by the way, I forgot to mention this, right? So, you know, we removed one of the reasons why you need a number of large, num large number of modes, but not the other ones. So we're still restricted to no collision subspace. Okay. So, you know, this obstacle remains. I thought we would clear it, but we didn't. Um, now, one other kind of offshoot result that we got from this was, you know, how do you deal with collisions? Okay, so I'm gonna try to go through this very briefly, just kind of give you an idea. Um, but recall that the permanent is given, the probability has to do with the permanent of a submatrix. Um, and when you have collisions where more than one photon ends up in the same mode, this corresponds to having repeated rows or columns in this matrix, right? Um, however, repeated rows or columns makes the permanent easier to compute. So if you have too many collisions, you know that you can compute the permanency efficiently in a classical computer, and then you can simulate the systems efficiently, okay? Um, but what if you have just a few collisions, right? So what is the robustness that you get to collisions? And um, so we've proven something about this. Um, and our approach here was to intervene only on that step two, right? So this proof that I'm gonna describe now has nothing to do with boson sampling, has nothing to do with Gaussian boson sampling, it has nothing to do with the system. It is just showing that computing, you know, if you have the ability to compute the permanent of a matrix that has repetitions, a Gaussian matrix that has repetitions, you can therefore compute the permanent of a matrix that has no repetitions, a Gaussian matrix that's smaller, but doesn't have any repetitions, right? That's the idea. So what we're doing is we're just saying that these two functions up to some scaling the errors, which I'm gonna tell you shortly, but these two functions are equally hard to compute under that regime. And therefore you can just repeat the entire argument, both, both for Gaussian boson sampling, but also in the original paper by Scott and Alex, right? You can just go back to the original paper and repeat the entire thing, but just where permanents appear, you can just replace by these other guys, these permanents with repetitions and everything's gonna work out. Um, so the idea that we do, I'm going to describe it very shortly. Um, you know, you imagine you have some uh, Gaussian matrix, which is a C by C Gaussian matrix, and you're gonna repeat K of its rows or columns, okay? Um, and here actually, you know, I'm gonna imagine you're gonna repeat only rows. So imagine that the original matrix was rectangular such that this thing is going to end up being square. So you're gonna repeat only rows and imagine that you have, um, so this is the matrix, right? And imagine that you have an outcome that looks like this. So you have three photons in the first mode, two photons in the second mode, right? If you have this, what you're gonna do is you're gonna to need to repeat the first row three times and the second row two times, okay? Um, so now you get this larger matrix, um, but now you, you, know, you need the larger matrix to be square because you're gonna compute the permanent difference. So you need to kind of fill in the blanks with something. So you just fill in the sort of extra columns that you had to, invent and infuse that with a bunch of Gaussian random variables, right? Because remember by hypothesis, the two matrices that you're trying to compare are both Gaussian matrices. So, you know, you need these guys to be Gaussian random variables as well, just to kind of satisfy the definition. Then what you do is you consider a slightly different matrix on the larger side, and you consider a small deformation of some of its matrix elements. Right, so you're gonna get some of the matrix elements and you're gonna multiply by this quantity Z, which has to be close to one. Um, the interesting thing now, the sort of central part here is that when you compute the permanent of this large matrix, this permanent is given by, you know, some constants, which matters, um, times the permanent of the smaller matrix, which is the one that you care about, plus something which is kind of depends in this extra variable Z, right? So effectively what you did is you wrote this guy as a polynomial. And the thing that you care about is the sort of constant term in that polynomial. Okay. So, you know, by assumption, we can estimate this polynomial for Z close to one, right? Because we're assuming that we can estimate the permanent of the large matrix. Um, but what we want is this polynomial computed at zero, right? Because if we had that, if you just take zero here, zero here, zero here, what you get is just the value of the permanent of the smaller matrix that you care about. So what you do is you compute 
you know, this polynomial for a bunch of different values. And then you just use some kind of polynomial interpolation method to estimate the value of this polynomial in that um, place that you care about. Okay, that's the sort of very, very high level outline of the idea. And the degree of this polynomial is going to depend on the number of collisions that you have. So when you work out all of this, right? So you work out all of the details, what you get is this thing, um, which, you know, the thing that I want you to look at here is Beautiful. the, yeah, yeah. <laughs> is how, how, you know, the scaling between the errors, right? So you can estimate one function to error um, one epsilon. It's kind of hard to annoy because you have two variables which are called epsilon, but, you know, you can compute one of the functions to this error, and you then can compute, this means that you can compute the other function to this error, right? But these are related by a thing that looks super nasty and scales very, very poorly with the number of collisions, okay? So, you know, what this implies is that we have only managed to prove that these functions are equally hard if you only have a constant number of collisions, right? So if the number of collisions is constant, then this all thing does not decrease, does not increase exponentially and everything is well behaved. Okay, so you know what this shows is, and this was lifted, you know, almost entirely from another paper that I had with Scott, which lets you deal with a small number of losses in boson sampling. So it's essentially the same skeleton of the idea. And you know what it shows is that both Gaussian boson sampling and boson sampling are robust. You know, their complexity proofs are robust under a small amount of collisions. Um, but I think that the method has promising features, which are kind of technical. I won't go into them here, but I think that you know they're. There's some surprising things that happen along the way that give hope that this might be improved on, um, although we haven't managed to do that. Okay, so um, that's essentially what I had to say. Um, just sort of recap, we have proposed this new bipartite TBS model. It improves on standard boson sampling by allowing for these arbitrary matrices, which you know provably removes the need for a very horrible scaling between modes and photons, suggests that even this guy can be improved, although we didn't get there. Um, and our approach also improves on Gaussian boson sampling because it doesn't require any new conjecture. So it kind of unifies the complexity of these two things. And you know, um, in terms of open problems that I think that we leave, one is, you know, can we leverage better the fact that we can implement an arbitrary matrix, right? So we just did the sort of simpler, most straightforward thing that we could do is just use the fact that we could do an arbitrary matrix just to Gaussian matrices because we wanted to rely on the same set of conjectures, right? But maybe you can use this arbitrary matrix to encode some interesting problem in this output distribution or you know, to improve on this regime between number of modes and photons or to prove something about different ensembles where maybe the conjectures are easy to prove. And I also think that there are some aspects of our results that can probably be improved on on this last part and the robustness of collisions, but you know I don't have anything concrete to say about that. Um, yeah, so thanks for your attention. Um, thanks, uh, Daniel, for the great talk. Uh, yes, we have time for questions and comments to the speaker. Hopefully some students got something. I hope uh, <laughs> maybe they will. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, sorry if it was too fast for students, but yeah, this, this, it is oh, kind this of is, technical, so yeah. No, this is, yeah, that's, uh, I think like it's unavoidable, like. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. It's, if one goes to like actual technical details, like why things yeah. as they are. Okay, maybe I start with a question. So uh, let's say what happens like if you uh, don't like, okay, have you considered the situation uh, when you don't, okay, the, like I know we discussed this, this anti-concentration uh, conjecture enters in uh, boson something or Gaussian boson something in two different ways because uh, yes. uh, one way is when you uh, when you want to connect between uh, like additive error and relative error, right? In this yeah, yeah. but in this let's say first step, right? Uh, another way, uh, another place where it comes in is when you want to uh, move from being able to compute uh, 
amplitudes, probability amplitudes to actually computing those permanents uh, that are like square kind of square roots. So yeah. I know, okay, this is maybe a lengthy introduction, but people in the field, as you know, consider the situation uh, when, uh, let's say, they didn't bother that much about anti-concentration, they sort of focused on, let's say, uh, yeah, let's say this additive error, right? Yeah. Budget. yeah. Right, let's say for random circuit something or for boson something as well. Uh, yeah. And my question is, uh, like, did you consider your scheme from that perspective? Does it, and if so, does it, off, does it offer some, uh, let's say, favorable properties compared to uh, boson something? Okay, so I'm not sure. What, what exactly, in what sense do you mean um, from that perspective here? Because, okay, so one, one thing like, that I could... uh, Okay, it's a bit tricky because like it's, it's all sort of nascent in this area of uh, like, you have this web of conjectures, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. But okay, for, let's say, um, I believe that for boson something, they, okay, maybe assume, uh, let's say you don't consider anything about uh, Let's say you just rely on the fact that it's hard to compute the absolute value of the, yeah. the like permanent, let's say to yeah. some additive accuracy in mm -hmm. on average. Let's, and let's say people, let's say they are able to prove it. And like uh, how to phrase it, let's say the stock buyer based algorithm gives you, let's say, accuracy to, let's say, of order one. Uh, I think of the dimension of the space, right? Yeah. This is yeah, the yeah. active accuracy that Stockmeyer gives you. So one over, yeah, this dimension. Yeah, the yeah, dimension of the collision-free subspace, I guess, in this case, that would be it, right? Yeah. But on one end, on the other end, you have uh, some hardness proofs based on polynomial interpolation, right? Yeah. And I think there is relatively little gap between the uh, like this uh, error budget that you get from just bold application of Stockmeyer yep. uh, and this uh, worst case uh, and proofs of uh, approximate average case hardness. It, mm -hmm. Does it clarify what I, uh, yeah, I, I think it's maybe technical, but. Yeah, I mean, yeah, maybe it's something we can, we can chat about in more with pen and paper. But um, what I can tell you is this, we, we did not, okay, so um, at, at the first level, the thing that we proved, we were really talking about Gaussian matrices, right? So re it really was just go back and do the same thing as boson sampling. Yeah. And, and again, it's Gaussian matrices. So all of the conjectures, everything is going to be the same because we wanted to, let's say, unify it. So we were worried about changing as little as possible in some sense, right? right? Now, one thing that, that happens is that one thing where the sort of stuff that you're asking might be relevant is on this kind of, um, when you're talking about this robustness to collisions, because this polynomial interpolation idea, you know, the one that I'm writing here, I'm writing of an interpolation between the absolute values of the permanents. Um, but there is another one, which is directly between the permanents, which actually has an insanely better scaling. Mm -hmm. Um, so you would expect that to actually be good, but then the problem is that you need to conjecture anti-concentration for a different set, right? So you, you need, you'd want permanence of matrices with repetitions to also anti-concentrate. And, and just to map the absolute value to the P2. And that one, we, we didn't touch, we don't know that. We, we tried a lot, we tried to push a lot in that direction, but we never got anywhere. Gotcha. So, you know, that's one of the things that I think that would, this probably can be improved a lot on if you try to, if you at least maybe are more flexible or try to kind of think outside the box in terms of this anti-concentration stuff, but we didn't, we didn't do that. Uh, gotcha. Thanks. Okay. I uh, maybe uh, allow others if they have uh, to have more questions. I hope. I ask. might have one. If, like, Please I don't like. quite. I don't quite get how the probabilities of the outcomes in your setup are related to the permanent. Like, how do you come from heptians to permanents? Like, right, can right. you maybe so, elaborate on that? 
yeah so um the thing is there is an identity that maps the hafnian experiments right so if you, i don't remember exactly how it goes but if you have the hafnian of a, a block a matrix that defined by the block is like zero c c zero then that reduces to permanent so so there is there there are some identities that connect hafnians and permanents for specific sets of matrices and it just turns out that you know when you consider this specific um setup um, you do get matrices that look like that, right? So they have a bunch of zeros and then the sort of computation of the half and reduces to the computation of the permit. So um, it's, it's just an identity between the two, the two functions. Um, and these zeros comes from the fact that there's a bunch of transitions that you can't observe, right? So there's a bunch of things that are not gonna happen because of this separation between the top and bottom nodes. Yeah, so it's, it's yeah, it's something along the mm -hmm. lines. Any more questions to Daniel? Okay, I have one open ended question about this uh, L1 uh, notion yeah, of yeah. approximation. So, just okay, when I was listening to you, I, what came to my mind was sort of physically, it would be much more motivated if, uh, if those distribution, like if you start from if your task was to uh, generate samples from distribution that doesn't approximate uh, boson sampling distribution, say boson sampling or any uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, any uh, uh, distribution came from any proposal, not like in L1 norm, but uh, like there is this notion called like computational indistinguishability in, in a, I, I think used in crypto, right? Mm -hmm. That like, you know, two distributions are cannot be distinguished via polynomial time uh, classical computer or something like this. Mm -hmm. So, do you? Do yeah, you but, but that, that sounds like yeah. That definitely sounds like what you would want. But the yeah. problem is how do how do you map that into a kind of quantifiable thing, right? So if you also want to go to experiment lists and say, you know, you need to aim for this level of experimental accuracy measured by this figure of merit. Um, how do you, I, I, I have no idea how you quantify this computational distinguishability in that sense, right? Mm -hmm. And it sounds like, like kind, kind of stuff like homograph distance and stuff, that's something that exists in principle, but it's kind of really a pain in the ass to prove. So, so I think that the total variation distance is one of the benefits is that it's kind of very directly um, measurable and computable, right? So you can just say, oh, you know, my experiment is within this amount of total variation distance. Well, in, uh, yes, at least until the, yes, for the smallest no, experiment. Because, like, yeah. computational is very hard, right? Yeah, that's true, yes. Yeah. And, you know, even experimentally, right? So these experiments with 100 photons, they don't compute total variation distance of anything. Of course. That's, you know, that's way beyond what they have the ability to estimate. Yes. But even this, like, you know, the, the, I think that there's a kind of two competing things here, right? So one is you would want exactly that which you said, which is, you know, what is the best figure of merit for two distributions to be computationally indistinct. Um, and, but on the other hand, um, you want something to tell experimentalists. So I know that in this recent paper by the um, group in Shanghai, right? One thing that happened was that uh, sometime after there was a, a paper by Google, um, I think um, showing how to kind of spoof their figures of marriage, right? So they were using, they weren't using quite the total variation distance. And yeah. the fact is that they could spoof these kind of figures of merit just by focusing on the sort of lower order correlators in the distribution. So you know, most, most, most of the distribution was weighed on the lower order correlators. So in some sense, you, know, you could get very, very close in total variation distance just by looking at that. And then yeah. that suggests that even total variation distance is not the best thing. So for in particular, in Gaussian boson sampling and boson sampling, it, that, this has suggested that these kind of higher order correlators play a much, much better role in sort of extracting the complexity from the data. So you should probably kind of move to that. But I think that this is very, very recent. I don't think anyone has actually worked out what like the complexity theory part of this would be if you looked at these other quantities rather than total variation distance. So there's definitely a lot of debate going on about right now about exactly that. Like what's the best figure of merit um, 
because right. total, variance, right. total variation distance apparently is not the best one either. Yeah, another, I guess, just if we have this open discussion, another approach would be to just modify your circuit a bit and do, you know, one of those techniques. <laughs> Oh, it's funny that Zoltan joined after the whole seminar. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but he's there. Uh, so uh, that it would be, you know, people do people know how to do like fidelity witnesses. Yeah, yeah. Right? Or they like for boson something. I think they there was some. I think it was TQC last year, right? Uh, yeah. It was a work by Leandro that. Alita. That one. Yeah, uh, I think uh, Ulysses. Shumbad, or I forgot who is like, I think French yeah. guy now in Celtic. Uh, yeah. Like you can do like a sort of, you know, just modify your, your measurements maybe a bit. And, you know, sometimes you just sample, but sometimes you do some homodyning and, or yeah. and yeah. You, you have your fidelity certificates. And then this is on the physics side, quite convincing if you have high fidelity. Yeah, yeah. So, so that that's the sort of things that convince physicists, but not computer scientists, right? So, because it's very device dependent, right? So, you you trust that you know quantum mechanics works, and then you use that to estimate how far away your experiment is from what you wanted. Right. But if you're kind of say a quantum computing skeptic, right? So you think that quantum mechanics doesn't work, we or maybe it's going to break down or something. Huh? We all are. No. Right, but you know, if, if you think that you know everything is everything about quantum mechanics is going to break up, break down, or something for larger systems that's going to make quantum computing fundamentally impossible or something like that, then that person wouldn't be convinced by that other metric either, right? Because they say no, you, you trust the experiments to sort of certify the experiment. Right. So I, I I think that you know I'm on the fence about that. So I think that that's a good thing. That's it's definitely a necessary condition, right? So if if you kind of pass these other sort of more experimentally based witnesses that are not device independent. That's necessary to show that you're close. But you know, for some people it might not be sufficient. Of course. So yeah. just a crazy idea. Maybe it is it might be possible to cook up some hardness thing, uh, like actual complexity theoretic arguments in some kind of protocol when you sometimes do certification, you kind of obfuscate things a bit that you know sometimes do uh, certification yeah. sometimes do uh, you know sampling from something that you, know, you mean just... along the lines of kind of blind quantum computation where you just have some you yeah. kind of you might maybe lay some traps for the the yes. the adversary and then they yeah the problem is that those tend to also be at least for blind quantum computation they tend to be adaptive Right, so you know you're yeah. gonna receive some mess. And the problem with boson sampling is that if you are allowed to do adaptive things, then it becomes universal for quantum computation. So it then sure. the question becomes more muddy yeah, a little like bit. The but you know, the question is like when you would hey. do like adapt because like many of those certification proposals, they are just about changing the last part. You don't don't change sure. the circuit. Yeah, yeah. And maybe then it's not so bad. Like if you can just change the measurement in the very end, right? Like. Yeah, sure, fair enough. So Something like that would work. I mean, like we some, have the, some... the, uh, the, the guest star. <laughs> yes, but Barash, look, you know what happened? I can explain, by the way, because I got the message that there is no group seminar. And I was like, <laughs> confused. And then actually nowadays I, but I guess that was the other seminar or group meeting. So I think the other message was very explicit that the other seminar is taking place. <laughs> It was not other, it was group meeting. I mean, I had two messages <laughs> after each other. Okay, so, so, so a so, question, I guess. You didn't listen to the talk, but I have No, but I, I like your discussion. That's why I'm going to jump in. So this, um, mm, I mean, one possibility could be exactly, maybe that's what you mentioned, you know, about. So I, I agree that like blind quantum computation could be very hard. But what about if you would do obfuscation in the way that if they would sample, they would not see what you are doing. They, they should have to sample like really a lot. Okay, I mean, it, it might ha have to do something else than boson sampling, I don't know, but something like that. But then you change something in the end and it becomes easy and they can see what you were doing. It could happen that actually you have such a situation. It could be, could be, yeah. 
some 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 sort of mild blind quantum computation, right? So it's not quite full powered blind quantum, but it's kind of one stage of of you're trying to hide away what you want to do, something like right. that, and then you get it's a kind of because blind quantum computation also looks like that, right? So you send whatever your specifications for the device, and then you you hide what which sure. of the things you want to do, right? So you have like trial runs, like verification runs, and computation runs, right? So here you could do something like that. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't have a good that it's a good it's a good approach I have no answer to. I don't think anyone has yeah I don't know what, to what extent people have looked at it. The one thing I maybe I, I don't know if Zotron was here when I was mentioned like one of the traps that you fall that is like is is the sort of you know you're trusting the device when you say that you're going to do sort of certification run to sort of certify the computation runs right that has an implicit trust of the device that you know someone might object to. You know, you, you, we might be happy with that. Maybe physicists are happy with that. Computer scientists are less happy with that. I don't know, but it's it's one of the traps. But I, you know, I don't have a strong opinion on that. Okay, thanks. But but no, I, don't, I guess nobody has looked with with these bosonic setups on blind quantum computation, or have they? I don't know. I mean, right now. most of the things that are going on there. It's for sure the, the ones I know about is about qubits. So, yeah. So, yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know. Like some native blind quantum computation for you know for like quantum optics, quantum computing. As, as I said, like one problem with that is that for boson sampling specifically, one problem is that blind quantum computation tends to be adaptive, and if you allow for adaptive measurements in boson sampling, it becomes universal for quantum computation. So you're not talking about the same problem anymore. You kind of okay, kind of lose true, the that's benefit. True. That's one of the problems. So you'd have to, to do something to avoid that. So maybe as you know, as Mihao was saying, maybe it's adaptive, but rather than changing the circuit, you only change like the measurement. So it's adaptive only at the level of choosing this measurement over that measurement. Except that I I would expect that might make give you universal quantum computation as well. I don't know. But I, I would expect like if you go to the KLM or some other version of that measurement-based quantum computation that, that you could restrict to looking only at the measurements and changing the Actually, that's actually true, right? Because you can just look at the measurements and then change the following measurements and not having to fiddle with the circuits. So I'm not sure. Right, okay. I, I mean, I, I, like, I don't know the details of those schemes. You know, what I had in mind was some kind of like interactive uh, proof when you sort of, uh, how to put it, when you are kind of not allowed to do mid circuit measurement, right? And then adapt what kind of happens. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Later, right. like, I see what you're saying. Uh, yeah. So that you just kind of, uh, yeah. Okay, I mean, we're in the spirit of that, learning. Uh, for me, that really requires pen and paper. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I don't just, have a good answer. It's just a good quick, idea, but uh, okay, quick technical question. So, like, just looking on your scheme, okay. Well, Actually, any Gaussian boson sampling scheme, uh, oh, yeah. you you just have uh, squeeze states and lip splitters and then particle number detection. So, uh, does this in itself, let's say, maybe upon some minor mo modification, like just prior to the measurement, like can one do sort of fidelity witnesses based on this? Uh, sure. That would be actually, I, you know, for example, for your proposal, like for or for Gaussian boson something, it might be, because uh, yeah, I could be, I don't know, because uh, because this work that I mentioned about boson something, they had to change to continuous variable regime, which is problematic, sure, sure. right? Yeah. Uh, to to kind of realize this, okay, they, uh, yeah, they they kind of. Yeah, you, you, you had this evolved Fox state, basically. And the fidelity of this you can do with CV, uh, right. in the CV formalism. But here's kind of the other way around, right? Like, can you do, uh, you, you have kind of CV state in a sense, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, I see what you're saying. Like, can you, can you read this backwards and try to use that to build a kind of fidelity witness? Yes. I, 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 sorry, I have no idea. I don't know. Sure, just uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I just yeah we, have, we haven't thought about that. Thing, you know, there are some students here, maybe they are interested. No, no, that, that's a good. <laughs> these are these are good good questions. Maybe someone will be interested in pursuing this further. I think I would, but I haven't. I don't have good answers for them right now. Uh, sure, sure. 
Uh, okay, last chance, guys, to ask anything to to Dan. Like, I guess we like uh, if he comes to uh, Poland, it will be next year. I guess not this year. I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so silence. Sounds of the sound of silence. Mm -hmm. Okay. If there are no further questions, let's thank the speaker again for uh, yeah, the thanks. nice talk and the discussion. And yeah, see you all next week. And I write you, Daniel, I know we have to chat and we are done yes. with the grant thing. Okay. Uh, so I have time more. Okay. Okay. Cheers. Thank you okay. all. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.